uh, hydroacoustics and with uh, microprobes is that we've been able to go out in the field and actually microprobe up um, individuals within a meadow and look at the diurnal utilisation and production of oxygen in those tissues within the plants within the meadows. And uh, surprise, surprise, uh, <laughs> plants in the field can have se severe hypoxia for up to eight, eight hours a day during night time when they're not photosynthesising and when you don't have enough flow across them. And this may be the cause for a lot of these diebacks we're seeing in Florida, for instance. Um, it's just a proposal out there, but uh, your plants are probably just becoming anoxic and un incapable of doing the repair mechanisms they're supposed to do during the night time, such that when the sun comes up, they're ready to photosynthesise again. Um, and of course, this all ties to environmental issues. And one of the biggest things we're doing right now is developing a toolkit to look at sediment stresses using microbes. I don't have to say anything. Perth is situated about here, um, right on the bottom end. And Shark Bay's halfway up that big flat bit. And we have somewhere between uh, 12 and 23 species, um, depending on where you are along that gradient, of seagrasses. There are only 72 species globally of seagrasses, so you can see the importance of West Australia and temperate Australia and tropical Australia in, uh, in the diversity, maintenance of diversity of these, uh, these important benthic habitats. Um, I always like showing this one. This is a, a Robert Orth slide. <laughs> Let's check out the seagrasses 100 million years ago. Uh, seagrasses are not seaweeds. They didn't evolve a billion, three and a half billion years ago. These guys evolved. They returned to the sea, as you all know, and they probably did it three times. And the three uh, uh, events of returning to the sea means that we have quite a lot of diversity in the word seagrasses. And this diagram is specifically showing you the diversity of seagrasses. Uh, some are colonising, some are opportunistic, and some persist for very long time periods in the system. Um, the colonising ones, they're fast growing, they're short lived, they have very quick turnover uh, in terms of reproduction, they have dormant seeds, they aren't really resistant to physiological um, stresses but they can, uh, they can recover very quickly, whereas the ones that we're used to uh, seeing for long periods of time, so the, the uh, Thalassia or turtle grass, Posidonia and Inhalus, they're slow growing, they live for a long period of time, they maintain the meadows for a long period of time. Um, their uh, reproduction, time to reproduction can be very long, uh, up to five years in some of the Posidonias. Um, and vivipary, there's no d dormancy, um, or direct developing seedlings is exactly what happens there. So there's no dormancy, there's no seed bank to talk of. They're resistant to change. When they change, it's a very long time period for them, the, for them to recover. So let's get to the real story today. <laughs> Welcome to Shark Bay. It's a World Heritage Site. It has, and the values, um, I won't read the values out, but the values are around seagrass habitats that formed the existing structure of, of, of Shark Bay. And the, uh, this, they support a whole range of diversity, including uh, feeding dugongs, dolphin, I'll talk a bit about dolphin later. And um, they've also created environments where stromatolites, or modern analogues, cryptalgal structures, uh, two str stromatolites are found. They're also, the area is also protected because of its uh, terrestrial values as well. And this is a Western Barred Bandicoot, one of the rare and endangered small marsupials that are, are So what makes Shark Bay very, very interesting is that it's at the tropical temperate transition. It's dominant. And um, these temperate species form the foundation to Shark Bay. So under a warming scenario, we're looking at potential loss of temperate species. But those are the things that have created the, the banks and structures that make the World Heritage Site so special. And one of the ones here is Amphibolus antarctica wireweed. And it forms 
uh, beautiful structures. I love these structures. I would love to know what forms them. These are all the black parts are amphibolous on these large banks that have been formed over thousands of years um, um, by seagrasses. The other really cool thing about Shark Bay is it's got a permanent salinity gradient. We don't know how long it's actually been there. Some, some papers talk four and a half thousand years ago. Um, some papers talk a thousand years ago. But the salinity gradient is pretty much permanent yeah, um, across this whole system. That makes it quite different than some other systems. For instance, Florida Bay has a, a semi-permanent um, seasonal uh, uh, hypersalinity salinity gradient. But this one is there for, for a good period of time. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the hypersaline basin here where the tremendolites are. Um, and I'm going to mostly talk about the seagrasses that form the banks and shoals that restrict the, roof, the flow of um, seawater and the mixing of, uh, of these systems with seawater. This area is also a desert, so um, the precipitations tend to a hundredfold, depending on which year you look at, of, uh, sorry, uh, evaporations tend to a hundredfold of precipitation. Now, I would like to show you this. Uh, basically, the seagrasses in the system are the base of the food chain, and there's a lot of top-down and bottom-up control in it. Um, but the values, I think, are really quite special about um, Shark Bay is that tropical transition, tropical temperate transition, where you have temperate species like this wireweed being chomped on by, predominantly, a, a tropical uh, macro grazer. So, spot quiz, what is that? What is it? Dugong, exactly, you can tell by the tail. It's not a manatee. Yeah. Um, and this video actually showed us that they actually cropped the, the amphibolus, which is pretty cool. We didn't know that before we did the work. So, give you a little bit of history of the system. So, what makes that gradient and why um, are we focused on seagrass in the system? This is the distribution of seagrass. It's about almost 4,000 square kilometres of seagrass in the system. Um, and these seagrasses have dominated for thousands of years um, in the system and have created banks and sills that are eight plus metres in height. And um, I'm just going to walk through a bit of Holocene um, history for all the ge geologists and geomorphologists in the group. Um, this is a age before present plot. I'm going to show uh, sections through here, um, 8,000 years ago, 6,500 years ago, 4,500 4, years ago, 1,500 years ago in present time um, in the next slide. So just keep that in mind. And if you look at the change in steric height of the sea, it's been quite small there. It's about a negative 8. Uh, 8,000 years ago. It went to a high stand in 6,000 years ago and has readjusted uh, to a low stand about 1,000 years ago and to a present level. So it hasn't just been filling up, it's actually gone up and, and um, uh, gone, gone down again. So this is what it looked like 8,000 years ago and, and the comment here is bench, ba the base rock is yellow, the green is actually seagrass derived sediments or seagrass dominated sediments. Um, and 8,000 years ago the seagrasses were basically in the, in the deeper water. By the high stand 6.8 thousand years ago, you, the seagrasses actually dominated that, that whole structure. And these sediments are up to 8 metres in depth. Uh, four and a half thousand years ago, we had a readjustment of the steric height and some erosion, but not a lot of erosion at that point. Uh, but by a thousand years ago, you can see the little yellow bits. These are re-moved, re, re suspended and, re and removed sediments from the banks. The banks themselves are white, rich in calcium carbonate. The base rock is red and high in silicates and iron and copper. So you can't mix them up when you see them. They're very, very different in colour. And that's what it looks today. So there's been a lot of reworking off these banks and shaving off them as, as the, um, as the uh, height of the, of the ocean changes. But these seagrasses form um, along the banks like this. Uh, two metre tall wireweed occurs in some of these regions down to about a half a metre in size. And uh, because they form these banks, 
the Hamlin pool area is rich in these stromatolites. So the cause-effect pathway that, that we've got to look after is the health of the seagrasses for the maintenance of these environments. The Hamlin pool stromatolites are oldest as 1,680 years old. So they're not old. They're not, you know, ancient stromatolites. They're actually um, modern analogues. And this just shows a series of ages of the different areas in the bay in Hamlin Pool. Other seagrasses, Postonia australis is another temperate species that's highly um, dominant in the system and is probably the former of the banks. It wasn't Amphilus that formed the banks, it was Posidonia. And then we have Cymodocea, you get that here. We have Holophila um, spinulosa. Um, and then we have Halidulli, Halidulli uninervus. It comes in less than a millimetre wide blades like this to quite lush meadows. And they've all got the same genetic signature. <laughs> you know, they are the same species. There's not that much variation between them. So in 2011, just before a major event occurred, we, had, we held a workshop where we compared the um, science for managing subtropical environments. And because Jim Falkin was there, we decided to compare Shark Bay with Florida Bay. And out of that came the importance of maintaining ecological resilience in the system under increased anthropogenic and climate change impacts. The other big thing was we really don't understand the system heterogeneity. This is a very heterogeneous system uh, with multiple gradients, and we need to understand that to aid in making you know, local decisions within the system. We were very concerned about event-driven destabilisation, and I'm going to show you why. And we were really interested in trying to get some more multi-institutional and multidisciplinary approaches, much like the Centre of Excellence um, approaches that I've, I've heard um, occurring now in Louisiana and Alabama to address specific questions. Um, what happened in 2011, whilst we were talking about it, we had a, a heat wave and the water temperatures, this is NOAA data so it's, it's averaged and smoothed, but the, um, if you look at the last one, which is actually uh, this one, you'll notice that the February temperatures are much, much greater than any other year. That's February temperatures. So this is 2006 to 2011. Um, and this is the sort of temperatures within the bay. So they were well into the 30s in some areas. Um, and if you measure the temperature in the water, not average it from NOAA data, it was about 34 degrees in a lot of the shallow seagrass meadows. It rarely gets above 28 there, and temperate species stop growing and do really bad things when they hit temperatures above 30. So this is what the healthy amphibious meadows look like, close up and far away. That's what they look like within two weeks of that thermal event. So it basically, Amphibolus defoliated. It dropped every leaf it ever had, and all you had left were these little sticks sticking out of the ground, which is just this, the wiry stems. And within months, they were then covered with uh, other, other uh, primary and secondary producers and secondary consumers. We went from about 80% cover across the whole bay in, um, before to less than 10% cover over many of the areas that we were monitoring so 90% of the areas we're monitoring over, an er over distances of 100 um, kilometres were showing this sort of impact. It was not something that just happened in a room this size. It happened over the whole system. And um, it was linked, it was a thermal event, but it was also, there were other synergy synergies going on. We had three major floods um, in a system called the Wurramulf River that river floods once every six to eight years on average over the last hundred years. And in that one year, we had three floods within a month. <laughs> so what ended up happening was you could measure an impact uh, as you moved away from the Wurrimal Delta. And in, in other words, the biomass of leaf material dropped dramatically until it, until it got into the um, clearer waters. So you had a light temperature interaction going in some parts of the bay as well. So leaf biomass did recover uh, over the two years post-disturbance, and this graph here is basically zero months, six months, and two years, and then biomass 50 grams per square metre, 100 grams per square metre, and this is where it was at the beginning, across the whole bay, and this is where we ended up at the end. But the important thing is that in 1987, 
the average weight was about 600 grams per square metre. So this is still a sixth of the, the coverage that was recorded in 1987. It would have been really nice to have more data points, but we only had the 87 data point. Below ground biomass did the exact opposite. We lost a hell of a lot of below ground biomass. Um, and, uh, you know, the question there is, is this a reallocation of biomass? Is it a sign that the plants are responding in some sort of resilience response? Unfortunately, much of that loss was actually death. So it's very hard to actually answer that question. As well as loss of biomass from 80% cover to less than 10% cover, we saw a catastrophic seed abortion in the Posidonias, that, the big strapulated um, um, uh, sp species. And this is just some data. I won't even go into the details. But basically, everything flowered like crazy, but there were no seeds produced. They aborted early abortion of seeds. Um, so we had a collapse for two years of um, production of flowers and production of seed. And another little bit of information from the seagrass is very interesting, was the Posidonias went into what is called pseudovivipary. Do you guys know what that is? It's what um, uh, montane plants do when they're under stress. They start to reproduce, can't reproduce. So what do they do? Is they, they produce more vegetative material. So these pseudoviviparous plants were coming out of the flowers because these plants couldn't flower. They didn't have the energy to flower. So it's a, it's a way of um, a vegetative uh, reproduction for these plants. Um, Interesting enough, we, did, we didn't find the evidence that they, the pseudo vip, we call them pseudovivips, um, actually settled on the bottom and became um, adults. That's the one piece of information we never found. We never found them in the meadows, we never found them on the sand, but the production of them was literally in the hundreds of thousands um, in, out of individual meadows. So clearly, lots of synergistic stresses, destabilised recovery, Increasing temperatures, increasing respiratory costs, in decreasing light availability, shift in benthic community structure from a, a predominantly autotrophic system to something that was sort of hetero-auto or even heterotrophic. Um, to give you an idea of the total ecosystem scale of the loss, 36% of shark Bay seagrass meadows were damaged in that one event. That's about 929 square kilometres. 600 square kilometres were completely lost. So this is not a small event. Um, if, and I was working with Paul Lavery at the time, and so Paul came up with these numbers. We had two to nine megatons of CO2 released. We, this increases Australia's emissions from land use on an annual basis by four to 21 per cent, except we don't actually measure coastal uh, carbon loss in our land use calculations in Australia. So this is on top of their land use calculations. That's equivalent to an annual CO2 output of 800 homes all off the city of Perth. Uh, equivalent to uh, 1,600,000 uh, cars, which are all the cars in West Australia driving around for two years. Or two coal-fired plants. Why shouldn't we use coal? I think that's a pretty good example of why we should use coal. <laughs> so clearly this sort of release of carbon, this sort of dieback from a single heating event is of a major concern for Australia. Um, there are other ecosystem impacts. You, I mean, I'm a plant guy, so I'll talk plants all day long, but the, the other effects were quite, quite large as well. Um, FIU... Uh, um, Hythouse and um, Falkrian were, and their uh, PhD students were busily um, putting criticams on green turtles and what they noticed were that there were areas that completely defoliated, areas that were mostly defoliated, areas um, from the criticams that most moderate foliage and some areas that were still lush in the system. And so they used this 0, 1, 2, 3 as, as a sort of uh, way of measuring the health of the seagrass meadows. And what they found was the seagrass condition be before and after they, um, they'd actually, um, the before and after the heat wave was dramatically different. Before we're looking at very healthy meadows and mostly we're looking at completely defoliated and very unhealthy meadows now um, after the event. Turtle health also followed the trend. 
So the proportion of turtles in good health, um, in poor, medium and good health, basically there were many, many more poor and medium health um, turtles than good health turtles at the end. And mostly that was a bit of a starvation going on. And the really cool thing about the turtles was they changed the behaviour. So uh, um, Heidhouse and, and, and his team have reported that turtles don't get up into the shallows to eat the seagrasses during the months of March and April because the tiger sharks take them out, right? So the behaviour is, uh, you know, landscape of fear. Turtles only feed the edges. They starve a bit during those months until the, until the tiger sharks move off because of colder water. Well, the turtles ignored that completely post, post this event and they were up f- feeding in the shallows. There's a lot more... Um, interaction between turtles and sharks because of that. Now, t- uh, uh, dolphins. Dolphins are one of these things. Everybody goes to monkey mire to, to uh, feed the dolphins in the shallows. Um, it's uh, not a value off the World Heritage Site, but it is definitely a tourist grab. And those dolphins have been studied since the 70s. So we have some of the longest data sets on dolphin behaviour in the world, uh, kept in, in the USA and in Switzerland. Um, monkey mire, there was really no changes reproduction-wise. Uh, the rates and calf survival were about the same. But there was a shift in foraging ha- um, habitats. For, and what happened was they moved out of the dense amphibolus into sandy areas. Because, well, actually, the amphibolus wasn't there, so maybe it wasn't a behavioural change, maybe it was just a habitat change. But on the Western Gulf, we were looking at decline in survival um, of about 6 to 12%, and uh, the carving was very, very low in the western part of the bay. And there's more activities, that, what they call shelling. They pick up shells and they slap them on the water, and it scares the... Um, they, they work in teams of about six. By shelling, they create bubbles and noise, and it scares the, the, the small fish into tight balls, which they then feed on. So there was a lot more increase in shelling at that time. Other changes, commercial fishing, um, shark-based scallops didn't like the hot water and basically collapsed and the fishery was closed for a little while. Uh, Blue swimmer crabs or blue manna crabs or Portunus um, amatus, um, the fishery was shut for 18 months before recovery occurred. And I won't go through the specific data there. So how will Shark Bay respond to global change? um, If we're looking at a global warming event, we've already got some pretty significant data that suggests if we have increase in these sorts of events, Shark Bay will change from a temperate dominated seagrass environment to potentially a tropically dominated environment. Um, We will lose those large uh, habitat formers for smaller, more, uh, more ephemeral species. So Seagrass loss will affect the entire ecosystem and world heritage status. This is the important message. Um, bottom-up impacts on habitat are important for the fisheries. We need both research and action on the ground. And can we assist recovery with restoration? I'm not going to go through all of these, but this is what we've done. We were there for the event, and this is the sort of work my team is doing in that system. And we are moving very cl- uh, very far into this, looking for adaptive populations to high temperature and extreme uh, variance in temperature in the system because of the strong salinity grain that's been there for thousands of years. Um, But we're also looking very, very hard at the role of microbes in the whole process and seagrass restoration. Well, that's all good and fine. Seagrass is going to be looked at by by Gary and looked after. What, What about the rest of the system? So in 2018, we held a a, a workshop for 70 science and industry experts looking at ecosystem change. And this was driven by the community. They want to know how they can adapt to potentially losing the values in the system. So tourism wants to know what happens if we have the same impacts we had during this heat wave on what they do. And so so does commercial and recreational fishing. So we had this workshop, had a lot of fun. I'm not going to walk through all these. These are the gaps we identified. Um, And came up with a series of recommendations. Now, the interesting thing is if you read these recommendations and the 2011 recommendations, it starts to sound the same. (laughs) We all want to have a a, a shared vision to address the integrated management of the system. Um, And we want to manage it for maintaining world heritage status. 
We want to have a management policy uh, response that is adaptive and rapid, which seems to be the big stumbling point, to maintain resilience in both natural environment and the, res the human resilience in the system. Um, we want the activities people value to continue to attract people to the environment. And we want a continued focused research that supports management responses and intervention. We don't want to stop the, the really cool basic research we do in the system, but we, we want to make sure that some of that information actually feeds into the adaptive management, management framework. So, thanks, and this is what a stromatolite looks like. And don't listen to Ken, they're really interesting. I have a whole lecture on these. <laughs> he thinks they're just uh, rocks. <laughs> um, on that note, thanks. Um, as a biologist, I, have to, I struggle with the fact that people don't realise that the, the rapid change of climate, and especially in oceans, is happening. And sea snakes, classic one. In the, in the early 80s, I used to swim through balls of sea snakes in this environment. This is all observation, so there's no numbers to back it up. We see, when we see a sea snake now, we chase it because we generally would see, I go up six times a year and we would see sea snakes probably once or twice, and that'd be it. So sea snakes are one of those indicators we should be out there looking for. <laughs> Question, sorry, I took over that one. <laughs> yes? No, it ended up in the system, so in the deeper water. And what we ended up with was black water, um, or what do you call? What do you guys call those things? Jubilees. <laughs> we end up with um, deep oxygen deoxygenation, uh, where a lot of a lot of especially crustaceans were actually pushed up into the shallows. So I was really intrigued to hear about jubilees. Now we lost in areas where we had complete defoliation and no recovery. We lost between half a meter and a meter of sediment. Oh, so sediment. And it's all rich in organic detritus. Mm. Yes. Uh, we're seeing that on the in the temperate coast of West Australia, not so much Shark Bay. We just see collapse. We don't see change in timing. They still reproduce about the same time of year, but they don't produce seed. Um, on the temperate coast of West Australia, we're we're seeing a, a later development of the seed and the fruit. So, and it's about a month. It's already a month later than it normally was. So, mm. yes. Well, I think the survivors of these events, so many of these places you, where we've seen major loss, it's from 80 to 10 percent or 80 to 20 percent. Um, and the individuals that survive are usually um, clumped, so suggesting they're potentially a different genotype. We've, we're just starting a project looking at the adaptive potential of some of those genotypes for restoration into areas where we've lost the other ones. Um, because you're looking at a constant um, 
salinity gradient, the, the hypothesis basically is, is rested on this assumption that these uh, populations have been isolated um, and so high sa highly saline populations may be the big saver um, in a warming temperature environment because those guys get the hottest temperatures normally and the coldest temperatures. So they're thermally tolerant of both cold, cold and hot, hot. So, um, but that's a brand new project and we just collected the first season of data. Exactly, yeah. And you, what, if you're interested in fish genetics, yeah. that needs to be done because we have, you know, we have a pink snapper. Come on, help me out with the name. I can never remember it. Uh, yeah, snapper. pink snapper. It's about this big. You know, lovely. I can show you a video of catching them. Um, and um, in Shark Bay, we have those pink snapper are in three separate populations. So they're in a hypersaline population, a metahaline population, and, in, and they're separated by bays. So there's differentiation across all sorts of levels with those guys. It'd be really interesting to study those. Yeah.